John Long, and I'm a professor of biology and cognitive science. I'm also chair of the biology department, and I'm director and co-founder of Vassar's Interdisciplinary Robotics Research Laboratory. That's who I am. What I've just done is to write a book called Darwin's Devices, What Evolving Robots Can Teach Us About the History of Life and the Future of Technology. evolve and build robots to test ideas about animals and their evolution. So robots serve as models for us. And so there are many things we can't do with animals because they're so complex. So it's very difficult to take a, one of the things I do is to take a biomechanical approach where you're trying to understand animals as athletes. And that's because animals have many parts and those parts have multiple functions. So one of the ways we test our ideas about how how we think the complex animals are working is to try to build them. And if you can build it, you understand it. So that's sort of the basic proof of concept that we do with our robots. And, and if, if there's another problem, which is dead fossils tell no tales. So to understand what happened 500 million years ago, which is exactly where I want to understand what was going on, we have to reconstruct, reenact those evolutionary processes that may have driven the origin of vertebrates, the group to which you and I belong. We use two kinds of models. We use our embodied robots, and we use digital robots. These are robots that are done on computer. And they both have weaknesses and strengths. The real strength of an embodied robot is that you can't violate the laws of physics when you build an embodied robot. It either works or it doesn't work, and that tells you immediately something about what you've done. You also get the physics for free. You don't have to solve it. When we try to build our fish robots or our fish models on the computer, we have to have mathematics that describes the fluid that the fish is swimming in, mathematics that describes the fish bending, mathematics that describes the muscles, and then the interaction of all those things. It's a very complicated kind of model called a force-coupled model. And so once we get one of those models done, however, we can run a gazillion generations. We can change parameters, and so we can cover a lot more territory. But those computer models, as they stand right now, are never as complex, interestingly enough, as our robot models. Some of the biggest surprises for us came with this idea um, of what happens after you evolve your robots and you see a change in their behavior over generation to generation. And I should tell you a little bit about our robots. We were modeling early fishes that were about 500 million years old. And so we used what we know about living fishes, brains, as the brain of these fish. And we were interested in the evolution of structures like the backbone, for example. But we weren't interested in the evolution of the brain. So we didn't touch the brain. So all we did was evolve the body. So here's a big surprise. You evolve the body and you get smarter robots. You don't need to touch the brain to become smarter. You can just have a smarter body, if you will. And the reason that's a surprise is because as humans, we're so focused on our heads and the giant size of our brain, right, that we think this is the ultimate answer to any question about animal intelligence or human intelligence. And sure, brains are important, but they're not all that's important. So that was just a really cool surprise that we had. Robots in war are getting a lot of press right now, and certainly What's happening, the use of our drones, both by the military and by the CIA, are getting a lot of press. And here's the crazy thing. There are over 50 countries right now that have active robotic warfare programs. So we are in a new arms race that has to do with robots. Right now, the drones that operate by the U.S. in Af Afghanistan are remote controlled. There's a human that's sitting there in the control loop making a decision about whether or not that robot, which is what a drone really is, it's a flying robot, is going to drop a bomb, let's say. Now that robot has a lot of its own autonomous functions, where autonomy is the ability to operate without a human helping you out. So the drone is really flying itself. And so the next stage is going to be a drone that's able to make command decisions that a human has been making for it. And this has been in the press. What we've learned from our evolving robots work is that it's quite logical that people are going to understand that when you evolve robots, you get novel designs that are dictated by the relationship between the robots and the environment. So just like evolution works in animals and plants, you get this matching between what's happening in terms of environmental change 
and, if you will, the design changes in your animals or plants. So I really felt compelled to say, hey, everybody, wake up and smell the robots, right? We're going to have to pay attention to robots. They're not going to go away because they're incredibly effective politically right now. They appear to be effective as weaponry as well. So they're going to get autonomous, fully autonomous. After that, we already know how to program robots so that they can learn on their own. So they'll have adaptability on the battlefield. And then finally, from what we've learned about evolving bodies, is I expect to see hardware evolution on the battlefield as well. So if you have a change in the weather and suddenly your vehicles aren't working as well, there can be adjustments to that, or changes in season, or changes in the tactics of um, the enemy in there. So I think we're going to see a lot more robots uh, on the battlefield. I had the good fortune to be here at Vassar College where we have enthusiastic science students. And so for over 15 years, we've had students working on these robotics projects. And what the book is, is really talking about our adventures together as researchers and what we've done, what, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And uh, students get involved in my lab at every stage from coming up with what are the interesting questions to figuring out the methods to answer those questions, to running the experiments, doing the analyses, going to meetings. We take them to scientific meetings where they present as scientists. And then many of them earn co-authorship. And so they help write the paper. And so we've got a bunch of papers with Vassar student names on them. So, you know, the, the students who work in our labs here and the scientists at Vassar really are working scientists.